and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hi, David. Hi, Rhonda. And hi to all our listeners. Welcome to pod. <clears throat> excuse me. Welcome to podcast one forty-five. David, we got you got a really interesting email from Dipti Josh, who is from India, and she came all the way from India to attend a, one of your intensives in Canada last year. And she's really a cool person, and I'm hoping that she'll uh, get her confidence up high enough to start the first uh, Feeling Good Institute in, in India. She's a real smart lady and a really, really neat lady and would fit into that position really beautifully. That would be so exciting. <clears throat> well, she asked you a really, a really important question. She said, is it possible to have a podcast exclusively on paradoxical techniques? Here's what she said. I feel paradoxical techniques are very challenging and that a lot of skill is needed to use paradox effectively. Along, Can you include, please, along with the explanations, the reasons why these tools are so effective? Well, that's a great question. And um, I'm going to approach it slightly differently, although we can certainly include some paradoxical techniques in this podcast, but it's probably 30 minutes wouldn't be enough to, to teach people how to, to use all of the paradoxical techniques. But I thought in, instead that uh, that team therapy is uh, totally immersed in, in paradox. Every piece of, of team therapy, T equals testing, E equals empathy, A equals agenda setting or, or paradoxical agenda setting, and M equals methods. Paradox is woven into the core of each of those four steps. And I thought we could start out by, by explaining wh why, why those steps are, are paradoxical and what's paradoxical about them and, and why each of those steps is so, so, vitally, so vitally important. Okay, well, David, T equals testing. Why and where is the paradox in testing? Isn't that pretty straightforward? Yeah, well, as, as you know, that we test patients at the start and end of every therapy session. Uh, how are you feeling at this moment? And, and then we also have asked the patients to rate us in the waiting room at the end of the session, rate us with extremely sensitive scales on, on empathy, how, how warm was David, how, how caring w w was was David or the how therapist? How well he listened? Yeah, how well did he listen? Did he really understand how I feel inside? Uh, how, how trustworthy was he? And then how helpful uh, w was David in terms of actually helping me solve my problems in my marriage or my depression, my panic attacks, my OCD, whatever it is. Now those questions are set up uh, to where uh, the highest response they, they go from zero, not at all true. To, to four, which, which is completely true. And, and if the patient scores you as uh, very true, a three on each of the five items, say for empathy, you'll get a 15. Now a 20 is, is the lowest passing uh, grade. If you get even a 19 on that scale, uh, that's a failing grade because it means in one of those five empathy areas, you're, the patient is, is saying, it wasn't really what, I, what I'm looking for. You were warm, David, but I didn't feel that real chemistry. Or you did a good job of listening, but you didn't really hear but there's how I... There's something that you missed. Yeah, there's something you missed. You didn't really get how I felt inside. And so what we're really doing is hoping for, for, for failure. See, people say, why are you so perfectionistic demanding a 20 on these... Yeah, like scales. is a 19 good enough? That sounds pretty good. Yeah, no, no, a 19 is a failure, and, and we're anti-perfectionistic, so we're hoping for failure. That, that's what's paradoxical about that, because that, then it, this will allow us to have a conversation to deepen the relationship, uh, to, to really hit, hit, hit the ball out of the park. And, and it's the same on the, on the testing, it, like I'm going to find out how depressed the patient is at, right now at the start of the session, just before they come in, how depressed they are, how suicidal they are, how angry they are, how anxious they are, and how happy they, they are. And I'll see, I'll see those scores, and then we'll have the session, and then 
they'll go and sit down in the waiting room and take the same scales again and see how much I've improved. Well, what most therapists are going to find out is that your patient didn't improve significantly during the session. And if you look at the scores over a period of time, you'll see that there's very little improvement or very slow improvement. And that's what you're hoping for. You see, you're hoping for technical failure as, as well as failure in empathy and, and helpfulness. You, you want to see that, that you didn't get the job done. Why would that be? Why would a team therapist be hoping to do a crappy job? Well, they're not hoping to do a crappy job, but they're hoping that when the patient tells them that they've done a ha- crappy job after they've done it, that they can repair that and heal it and have a, a conversation that will bring them warmer and closer yeah. and, and to a deeper understanding of their patient situation. Yes, be- because your great home runs in therapy almost always result from the therapist's failure. So at the testing, we're allowing therapists to fi- find out all the areas that, that you're testing. And I'll give I mean, you... you're not striving to fail, but you're acknowledging when you fail... Failure sometimes is a is a you know this um, part of success. So when you fail, then you can you know work more towards success. It's kind of how I've done this podcast since I feel like I've <laughs> sure, sure. so often. But, but but I often tell patients your worst therapeutic failure is your greatest success in, in, in disguise. In a way, we we do kind of I do kind of hope hope for failure because that allows me then to make something magical happen with with the patient. Mm-hmm. Like I, I treated a woman, uh, just disguised her identity. Let's say she was a top executive from San Francisco and a very uh, attractive, trim woman, uh, young and, you know, super healthy. And But she said she was a bit perfectionistic and, and, and depressed. And, uh, uh, this was back in the days before I was doing the kind of testing that I'm, I'm doing now, and I wasn't as, as rigorous about it. But she she was moderately depressed, and but she was a joy to work with, and she just admired me and was singing my praises every every session. At the time, I was using the old Beck Depression Inventory, and I remember she was real depressed, actually, at the beginning. She had a 40, and 45 is the worst score you can have on that. So, so, I mean, she, she was like an inpatient patient, but she was functioning as an executive and, and, uh, and then she was telling me how great the therapy was and she was doing a lot of homework on her perfectionism and this type of thing. And then about the 10th session in, I, 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 I said, gosh, I haven't been giving you the depression test every week. What, would you mind just taking the, the Beck depression in, inventory now? Because I was thinking I could talk about her in a workshop and show how someone with this super severe, extreme level of depression, how you could even help them with, with cognitive therapy. And she, she, she took it and took about a minute to fill it out. She handed it to me, and I was shocked. Her score had gone from 40 to 43. And 43 is beyond the level of people who commit suicide or who end up in the hospital. So it, wasn't it scary for you to see that? It was. It just blew my mind, and and I I could I couldn't believe it, because uh, here she she had me laughing all the time, and she was chipper and poised, uh, probably poised and admiring and beautiful looking and trim, athletic, you know, just like, and and I said, you you know, call her Magdalene. I said the the goal of therapy isn't isn't to like do clever wonderful homework on your your perfectionism. And it's been a joy working with you, but to cure you of your depression, and 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 not only have I not helped you, you've gotten worse, uh, and I, I'm feeling terrible right right now, and and I I must be missing the boat, uh, and and I wonder, is there something I'm missing? Is there there's something you're not not telling me? Uh, what 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 what's going on, Magdalene? And she got real quiet for about a minute, and then. And she said, well, I've, I've been struggling with whether or not to tell you this, but uh, uh, and I'm so, so, so ashamed to say this, and I, I, I don't think I'm, I'm supposed to, but uh, I feel like I'm being disloyal. But when, when I was a little girl, my, my parents fought all, all the time, and it, it scared me. They, they were screaming and shouting, and it was physical fighting. And I, I just was terrified, and, and I would go and hide in, in my room. And then my father would come in and see me huddled and, and crying and hiding. He would pick me, take me in his arms, and pick me up and throw me against the wall. 
Oh my God. And I'd fall on the floor and then he'd pick me up and throw me against another wall. And she was such a, she had been an athlete growing up, a top Olympic type athlete. And I could see, you know, I could probably pick her up myself. She probably like weighing 90 pounds or something, something like that. And she just started uh, sobbing and, and said, so I just, I know I shouldn't have told you that. And, uh, and then the, the, like the, the, the true self that she'd been hiding c- c- came out and allowed us to, to connect on a much, much deeper level than, than doing exercises on her for perfectionism and, and stuff. Right, and she wouldn't. You would never have known she was depressed if she if she hadn't filled out that yeah the forms the the form and and then the fact that I had failed her so badly led led to the the, the breakthrough because then over the next three sessions suddenly she wasn't the chipper yuppie anymore and and we were able to re, to relate deeper and with compassion we still kept doing daily mood logs and cognitive therapy exercises but on a much deeper level and over those three sessions her score fell from forty three to zero. And then she re- it was a true recovery at, 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 a deep, at a deep level. But if I hadn't had that failure, which was revealed through the testing, I would have completely, completely right, missed the Right, because you're yucking it up in the session and she's looking happy and yeah. poised, yeah. so she wouldn't have ever... Yeah, and I was going to brag her about it in a, in a workshop yeah. and show I only did the test to see how the source had improved. So I could say, see there, cognitive therapy works with someone very severe. Yep. Uh, so, um, so that failure led for you, her to disclose what she was really experiencing. Yeah, and that, that, that's the paradox. And over the years, I, I've come to see that the best therapy that I've ever done has always come through some kind of therapeutic failure or other. And, and there's nothing wrong with failure, but you have to know you're failing and you have to not be afraid of it. And, you're not, and, and not beat yourself up for it. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and it's the same with 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 loved ones as as well. We'll, we'll that's a subject then for, for another day. But uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's really clear. What's paradoxical about empathy? About empathy. Well, um, at the uh, E equals empathy phase, uh, what what you're gonna, most therapists find when they use my empathy scale, uh, uh, which we call it evaluation of therapy session, and there's a five-item empathy scale, a five-item helpfulness scale, and other therapy process scales that the patient fills out immediately after the session, slips it under your door, puts it in your box, and you can look at it and see right away how, how you're doing. And most therapists will, will be shocked to discover that you'll get failing grades on the empathy scale and helpfulness scale from uh, most, if not all, of your patients uh, initially. And that's that's that that's very painful. Uh, it's painful painful for me to to see that it's kind of the death of the therapist's ego when the patient says you you don't really understand me you don't you don't really care about me. I actually have an example of that. Okay, give give, give us one. Yeah. So I was I've been working with this young woman who um, is coming for a relationship issue, and we had about two or three sessions, and she was doing relationship journal, and she'd bought your book, feeling good together. So she was doing homework. She was a perfect patient, and um, at, in the session, she was she was making some really self critical comments. And I said, well, we could either we could go two different directions. We could look at you know your internal and do personal work and see what the thoughts and feelings are that you're having that are influencing your relationship, or we could keep doing relationship journal and talk about five secrets and how you're relating to your your partner and. And she said, oh, I don't know. I can't decide. Both sound good. Why don't you decide? And instead of saying, no, no, this is your life. You choose. I said, I was feeling a little impatient. So I said, okay, well, let's do a daily mood log and we'll do the, the we'll do, we'll go down that path. And in the midst of doing it, she was kind of wiggling and, um, you know, she was like, ah, this isn't working for me. I said, okay, well, let's just go back to the relationship journal. And, um, sure, I got a failure. I got a failed grade for empathy and she said I wasn't listening and, and that I was being really controlling. And so then that led, when she came back the next time and I asked her about it, and that led to a, a much more in-depth discussion about what it feels like to be controlled and her experience with that and childhood experiences of that. And so while it was a failure on my part because I, I became really controlling and impatient, it led to a deeper understanding of her as an individual, as a person in her life. I love what you're saying. I've had that so so many times too. And when I was a resident, you see, I was taught that when the patient criticizes you, that's called transference, which means they're seeing you as their parent and they're distorting 
what's really going on. And so it's the patient's problem. It's a subtle way of, of blaming the patient. And what we're saying in team therapy is that when the patient criticizes you and gives you a failing grade of 19 or lower on the empathy scale, that, that's because you really are failing them in ultimate reality. It's not just their distortion, although there is distortion in what they're saying, but it's also absolute truth at the same time. And that if you'll acknowledge that, that will lead to a breakthrough in, in, in the therapy. That's what I mean, your worst therapist failure, your worst failure is your greatest success in disguise, because like your patient there, this is probably the huge issue in, in her life. Right. And and you fell right into the trap and started controlling her and being ir irritated with her, which was, oh, that's bad therapy. But that's actually highly desirable to screw up in that way if you let your ego die, because then you can say, wow, I'm I'm that, the controlling mother now, or I'm, I'm the person who who's been doing this Who becomes to you. impatient, irritable, and can, takes over your life. Yeah. And so let's slay that monster. Tell me how you're feeling. Tell me about the, what is, how I failed you and what that's like. And then bingo, you, you suddenly hit a, hit a home run. Right. Uh, but it takes courage. And we have a new member in our uh, Tuesday group who emailed me uh, yesterday that he's, that he's dropping out of the group. Oh, I'm sorry. And I was pretty sure he would because he's he, he's he's been kind of implying that he's an expert in empathy, and that's why I set up the exercise tonight. And then he just where you're going to have to learn to respond to patient criticisms. You're going to have to use the empathy in your own work, and you're probably going to be shocked at at the at the scores at the scores you get. And and some therapists just they they don't want that. I, I did a workshop in Canada years ago, and I was going to do it on the five secrets of effective communication. And before the workshop, this woman approached me and said, oh, you probably have heard of me. I've published five books on empathy. And she kind of implied she was the world's top expert on empathic communication. And she said she was attending my workshop. And uh, if I needed help in the workshop, she wanted to volunteer and demonstrate, you know, to people how it's how a pro does it. Yeah, that was kind. And uh, I thought, oh boy, I think she's in for a bad ride today. And so I illustrated the five secrets, and then she jumped out. She wanted to be a volunteer for the demonstration. She wanted to be the therapist, and then one of the other participants volunteered to be the angry patient and criticized her, and then. She was supposed to respond as best she could using the five secrets, and she was just terrible. She 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 was very defensive and and condescending and kind of arrogant and preachy. And then oh, this poor woman. And then of course everyone that grades her every gave her a C or a D or you know out of politeness, and it was just. That must Shock, have been so shocking for her. Incredibly shocking. And then she she did the same thing to the people in the group. She started getting defensive and insisting she was an expert, and what she had modeled is really, really correct, correct te technique. And I think the experience was probably very, very painful and annoying for her. But she wasn't open, you see, to, to, to hearing that uh, that 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 her skills, her interpersonal skills, were, were really extraordinarily bad. And 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 it's hard, you know, for people to admit that and 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 to say that and and to say, yeah, I. I I really have failed, but what, when, if you fail with dignity, if you die with dignity, that is your your rebirth. That is your 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 enlightenment. But the team really asks a lot of therapists much more than some techniques you can learn. It, it's it's learning something at a, at a very profound level. So that's the paradox of E equals empathy. Okay, let's move on to A equals agenda setting, or paradoxical agenda setting. Yeah, this is the hardest one for for therapists. All the although you, the other two first two were pretty <laughs> bloody, but uh, you see, most people go into therapy because they want to help and rescue people, and and it's out of the goodness of our hearts that that we want to help people. But it, there, it's also a kind of narcissistic codependency, and in agenda setting, you 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 bring to conscious awareness all the reasons why the patient should should not change 
rather than trying to, to sell them on something. We're, we're trying to sell them on the status quo and what their depression and anxiety shows about them that, that's beautiful and awesome. And to give up that urge to preach, to rescue, to help, to educate, to teach the, the patient something to, to, to save them. And this is just incredibly difficult for most therapists. And, and I, I would have to say I, many of them, perhaps more than 50% of therapists, have no interest in learning it because they're absolutely committed to being superior, to being experts, to, to helping people who are lower than them, to, 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 uh, to, to this model, there's something wrong with the patient and, and I'm going to fix you. And in team therapy, instead, we're, we collaborate with the patient and we show what's beautiful uh, about, about their symptoms and let them persuade us to change. You see, we become the voice of the patient's subconscious resistance. We, we, we do not become the voice of the expert who's trying to help. And that's really where the magic of team therapy comes from, more than any of the T-E-A-M, all four letters are massively important. They're all massively powerful. They're all massively new and, and different. But the, the most radically different one is, is the uh, paradoxical agenda study. Now, I will say that therapists have trouble learning it. Patients don't. I, I second that. I, I think it probably took me about three and a half years to learn. Oh, is that right? Doctor, yeah. And I wasn't doing it. I was going to group with Phyllis Cedars. I was reading. I yeah. was having individual sessions yeah. with her and coming on the hikes. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's, it's a comp, you know, it seems so easy when you're describing it here, but in actuality and, and, um, and doing it, it's not so easy. No, no. But it uh, eliminates all the yes budding. Oh yeah, it eliminates all of yeah. the resistance. Yeah, and patients the fighting. can't fight me any, anymore. It's the greatest thing. I, I patient can no longer defeat me with with resistance because I can I can sit with open hands and show them how beautiful their resistance is, and all the good reasons to resist, all the good reasons not not to change, and then now it's up to the patient to persuade me to to work with 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 him or her. It's a complete. It's a complete paradox, and it also turns the field upside down, as I've said on previous podcasts, because we're no longer seeing psychiatric symptoms, especially depression and anxiety, don't come from a chemical imbalance in the brain or a defective childhood or what's wrong with you. They come from what, what, what's right with you, what's, what's beautiful about, about the patient. Uh, so it's, it's just a complete, uh, a complete paradox. Now, I would say, and this is for a podcast for a different day, when we're working with relationship problems and habits and addictions, the motivation there often does not come from the most beautiful part of the, of the person, but from the dark side of, hum, of human nature. I, I, I'm not arguing that humans are all good. I think humans have positive uh, loving motives and hostile destructive motives as well that compete on on equal footing and so when you're going into relationship conflict especially you're you're getting into that uh, that angry vengeful uh destructive uh, and yet addictive part part of, of human nature we'll talk about that some more on an, on another occasion okay so but another thing is that when you're doing paradoxical agenda setting and you're bringing out well, you know these whatever the issue is is showing what's beautiful and great about you and the person can choose. Yeah, I really don't want to change. Exactly. I want, to, and then you yeah. can say, "Okay, well, what else can I help you with?" Yeah, yeah, absolutely. To to honor to honor them, rather than to think that we're we're trying to tell someone how to how to run their right, life. That we're the expert of their life. They can say, "You know what? I'm happy with the way things are. I yeah. accept this. I don't want to change." What else can I help you with? Or thanks and bye. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. And uh, boy. It took me years to to learn to do that, to have the courage to do that, and it it was just a career, a career changer. And you have to do it with warmth, not with sarcasm. See, one of the downsides of paradoxes that can be done sarcastically because you're ticked off at the patient and you're trying to manipulate the the patient. And all of team therapy is an art form, and you can use all of these hundred or more team therapy techniques. For good or evil, really, they have to be done with a with a lot of skill and a lot of compassion to be to be effective. David, that's that's I I love this discussion so far. Where's the paradox and methods? Uh, the paradox and methods is that let's say a patient has uh, the, the thought, like I think last week in team group we talked about how to get over the thought that uh, I should be better than I am. And I don't think we talked about this on a 
podcast yet, have we? Or well, only in the, my personal work. And your did I refer to that that session? I don't know. I wasn't in group last week. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, your personal work is coming up. It had that same dimension, actually. Uh, but but this therapist had had been to one of my workshops and did Mike Christensen's online class and got all excited that he was going to learn to become this great therapist. And, and then he, he, over time, he, he lost his faith and he stopped having his patients do the testing. And, and I think he had a patient who was late to a session or something like that. And then he, he got all upset and, and figured her, her being late was because he was a, wasn't good enough as a therapist. It turned out not to be the case, by the way. But we, we, we focused on the, this thought, you know, I, I'm not good enough or I'll never be good enough. And, and in the Tuesday group, I asked the therapist there, how many of you believe I'll never be good enough? And all the, well, we had probably 30 therapists there and they, every hand w- w- went up. And so we, we put that in the middle of a recovery circle with arrows coming out of it. And then we select all the techniques that we could use to crush that thought. Because the moment he stops believing that thought, I'll, I'll, I'll never be good. In fact, I was going to say we might do a whole podcast on just this this thought. I forgot to add that to our list. We we might have a podcast coming up from, for all of you who feel you're not good enough, show you how to crush the thought. But all I'm going to say right now is uh, I came up with 32 techniques. We had two recovery circles with 16 arrows. And in the middle of the circle is the thought, I'll never be good enough, or I'm not good enough. And each arrow is a different technique, an escape from that trap you're in. So you've got positive reframing and examine the evidence and let's be be specific and the double standard technique and the acceptance paradox. and Yeah, experimental technique, identify the distortions, all these techniques. And then what you do as a therapist, you, you fail as fast as you can. See, the goal of the methods is to fail over and over again. Well, why would you want to fail? See, we're trying to crush the thought, and we want to fail in our attempt to do that. Why? So that we can find the one that works. Yeah, because out of those 32 techniques, maybe it's number 21 that'll work for, for him. We, we don't know which one will... will when, they, when he recovers, it'll be like a whoosh, a sudden enlightenment, and it'll be fail, 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 and then bang, it'll, it'll happen all at once. Usually that's the way it happens. And so the faster you fail with all of these techniques that you're in love with that have helped other patients, the moment you find that examine the evidence doesn't work, or the double standard technique doesn't doesn't work, or the downward arrow technique isn't helpful, identify the distortions, it isn't helpful, and you keep going on until you find find the one that works. And so the goal of the methods thing is to fail as, as fast as you can. And again, it's the opposite of the way I was trained, and almost everyone was trained, is you're you're trying to be successful. You're trying to take some guru, some school of therapy, and make it work for a patient. That's what all of psychotherapy is is about. Or try to find the drug that's going to kind of cure the patient. And and here we're, we're not trying to to make a school of therapy work. I the methods I use are drawn from more than a dozen schools of therapy, and I I have no allegiance to any school of therapy. I love cognitive therapy. Sorry, I'm playing with my pen again. And I developed an awful lot of the cognitive therapy techniques, but but they're just techniques, they're just methods. And I've got psychodynamic uh, techniques that in, 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 the, in the methods that we use. There's over 100 methods now, and there's uh, uh, behavior, behavioral techniques and exposure techniques and paradoxical techniques and spiritual te- techniques and you know all, techni- all kinds of techniques. So then the paradox is failing as fast as you can to yeah, find yeah. the one that works. Yeah, to find the thing, because the goal is to cure the patient, and there's two parts to cure. One is the, the sudden and complete elimination of symptoms, that's the feeling better. And then the second goal is relapse prevention training. That's where you prepare the patient. These thoughts and feelings will come back, but you don't need to worry about it because here's what you can do to, to blast them when they, when they try to sneak, sneak back. And that's, and that's, and that's how it, it works. But it's more paradox than that because even at the methods level, say when I'm doing externalization of voices with a patient, I become and explain to the patient, I'll become your negative thoughts. You see, and it's going to be your job to to defeat me. Now I'll help and we'll do role reversals. But all these techniques, you're putting the patient in the role of the expert 
and you, the, the therapist, are the one who's letting the patient solve the problem. Now, it's collaborative and you're guiding them, but, but it's, it's, you're not in the role of the expert straightening the patient out because that just pushes people into a state of re resistance. So, for, for example, if we were doing externalization of voices, what is your name? Rhonda. And what is my name? Rhonda. And then you'll hear us doing this, the work with Rhonda. But then I would say, you know, Rhonda, you're not good enough. And, and I'm the negative Rhonda. And then you would say, well, there are a lot of areas in my life where I'm not good enough, but basically I'm pretty good in most things and I'm happy with who I am. Great. Now, who, who won that exchange? I won. Big or small? Kind of just big. Okay. Well, then you have to listen to the personal work with Rhonda to hear the huge. <laughs> and that's coming right. up shortly. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let, you, uh, uh, <laughs> let, let you ponder the fantastic solution and you'll, you'll hear it shortly. So did that uh, an answer uh, Dipti's question? Well, we'll wait to hear. For, I, I think you did a wonderful, really interesting job explaining paradox throughout the, as it, you, as you described, woven throughout the team model. Yeah. And, and that was really interesting. But two quick things about it. One, th these aren't gimmicks that you can use. Uh, this requires a transformation of the patient, of the therapist, before you can transform your patients. The therapist has to be healed in this way f for first. And secondly, when you're using these techniques, they have to be done with a high level of skill and compassion. There are schools of therapy where that use paradox in a kind of sarcastic, manipulative way. So really kind of making a fool of, of, of the patient. Uh, and that uh, appeals to narcissistic therapists, I believe, uh, who are all impressed with, with themselves. And I think there are, there are many like that. But, but Real paradox is, is really an expression of, of humility uh, and, and respect for what's really going on in, inside of the patient because there is a strong voice inside of the patient that, that does not want to change. It's, it's in all of us. Um, and that and, has really good reasons not to change. Yeah, and, and we're just, we're just on, honoring, honoring that. Yeah, that sounds so respectful, actually. Okay, David, shall we stop now? Well, I hate to. We're having fun, but yes, I think this was uh, short and sweet. How many minutes did that we do? That was 31 minutes. Tell 30... us about the upcoming intensives. Okay. Well, there's uh, going to be three intensives this this summer and fall. Uh, one in Calgary in the middle of July, one in South San Francisco at the end of July and the beginning of August, and then I'm going to do a four-day intensive for the first time in Atlanta, Georgia, and you were saying you knew the date? November 3rd and 4th. It's around November 3rd. Yeah, it's four days around November, yeah. probably. It's a Monday through Thursday. And uh, so if you're interested in some real big doses of Davidism and team therapy, that's really the, the way to, to do it. The, the intensives are, are just great. Uh, we do live work. We, we do personal healing for many of the people who come. You, you're going to practice all, all of the, these techniques and, and really emerge from an intensive with two things. N number one is dramatically improved therapy skills. And number two, uh, instead of being burned out and overwhelmed, you'll be refueled and leave with, with a sense of, of joy, excitement about your work, and, and really uh, feeling close to your colleagues as well. So the intensives are always great. And as I put in some of my blurbs that I sent out, if you can join us this year, uh, they'll be even better. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. Thank you. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.